All right, so thank you for being here to begin with. Um, we're going to talk today about um, devices that rock people. And these are really almost every device that you use, from mobile phone to your personal computer, to wearable devices, and the list goes on. Um, you can send me an email if you have questions, or you can use the question and answer slot to ask me a question after the talk. And you can follow me on Twitter if you want. Um, so, my name is Silvia, I am software engineer and PhD candidate in Barcelona um, in telecommunication engineering. I research um, mostly in privacy and web science, and I wanted to talk about the real dark web and what I mean by that. Um, so, what is, what is this all about? Um, I'm going to talk about marketing uh, to begin with, privacy, um, user tracking, online footprint, identity, and control. Um, why marketing? We're going to find out in the next few slides. Um, so, if you think about the, the companies that started since the 90s with the new economy and so on, they based the business to begin with, or they sustained the business for a while only on advertising. And so, uh, if we think of Facebook, if we think of uh, Google, if we think of Twitter and Instagram and so on, they let you know in the very fine prints in the user agreement that you signed that they sell your data in a way or another. Um, so the, the scope of this is kind of massive and uh, the actual objective of advertising is for you to buy product. And for you to buy product, they need to suggest you products that you might be interested in. And um, so they want to know as much as they can about you and so that they can recommend you products that they're more likely to buy because you're already interested in those things. And um, the thing is that they collect a lot of data about people and um, this is personal data and sometimes it's very personal and uh, very sensitive information. So um, the way this happens is that they basically track things that you do. Um, so these are your online activities, but since the online activities are so linked with the offline activities, sometimes also it's offline activities. So when you subscribe for a meetup that you like, they know the, the, the topic of that meetup. It can be technology, it can be skateboarding, it can be theater, literature, whatever it is, they know about it, for example. So um, it's not just something that goes into the, the online world, but it goes also into the offline world, so your real lives. And uh, this information is crawled, is analyzed, is, uh, is uh, indexed, and it's always available to the companies that collect it. So what about online privacy then? Um, do we have online privacy? Do you have to speak closer? Yes. <laughs> Okay, so if we are always uh, tracked and our actions are logged, uh, does it mean that we're always controlled and uh, some entities do always know what we do? And do we have lost the right to be anonymous when we want to? Um, so the thing is that uh, um, I always ask this, when, when I talk about privacy with friends or family of people that are not concerned about privacy, they always tell me, um, there is nothing that I am afraid that people can know about me. It's, it's like I'm not interesting enough for them to look at me, or um, I have nothing to hide. And this is not true because privacy is a fundamental human right, and it's documented in the UN chart. And um, it's kind of controversial because up to now, the, the right to privacy is the, is the right to information self-determination. This means that if I give you my data and I, I give you a consent to use my data, that is fine, and you can use them. But um, we don't line data. The thing is that I can give you access to my location, for example, with, through an application, but you know when that location information is used and to do what. So um, if I don't know what to use this information for, does it mean I gave you my consent to use it? So um, there is also another thing that uh, um, sometimes is said that privacy is a right to be forgotten because uh, people don't care about privacy and people want to share their lives and they want to put the photos of the food they eat on Instagram. Um, so the information that is shared online, it's uh, actually a lot. And in 2001, it was estimated that uh, it's 75% of the information that is, that is on the internet that is user-created, and that's personal information. 
So there was a kind of um, comic strip a while ago, I think it was in the 90s on the New Yorker, and it, says, it said, on the internet, nobody know you are a dog. But actually, this is not true at, at the moment, because they, they know everything about you. So um, sometimes this is the, there is this idea that is presented about the dark web. There is the web that is hidden by um, search engines, and um, um, there is uh, scary, and uh, it's not known. And it, this is usually associated with Tor, but it's actually um, the dark web is uh, any pages that cannot be crawled because it's protected by a password, for example. And that is kind of um, strange that they mention the dark web as so, because also Facebook is protected by password, and not all profiles can be crawled, but it's not part of the dark web for some reasons. Um, so the dark web is the web that companies cannot uh, reach a control or they cannot track data on it, basically, because they don't have access to it in order to crawl it. Uh, but if we, if we think about this picture in a different way, we can see that um, the web is the service that everyone uses, uh, like cloud services, email, um, shopping, music, maps, whatever. And then there is the data that are crawled and are shared by these services. So this can be called the dark web of marketing, and we don't know about this, and we think this, I think this is the dark web because it's, it's something we, we don't know about it, we cannot control. It happens on devices on which we have no idea what they're doing. And the thing is that we are perfectly fine with it because uh, we are okay with using these devices and we don't question the way they access our information. So this takes us to the, the idea of metadata and what they are. So there was a lot of talk about it last year and um, metadata, they're basically structured information. And um, they can be collected about online content, offline content, telephone calls, Whatever you think about it, you can have a metadata about it because, um, especially if you're a programmer, it's not something different from having an, um, an object and having something that describes this object. Like a car can be described by the parts of the motor or the part of the shell of the car and whatever. So, um, they're always been used by websites in different formats and not only by websites but by any application basically. Um, like XML is a very old format, and uh, it's, it's, not anything, it's not new, or it's, it was not invented by the NSA or anyone, uh, so was Jason. And um, to make some example of how this is embedded into website, um, I thought of the Google conversion tracking. So basically it's a set of tools that Google allow website to install, so that if you have a campaign on AdWords, and you want to know how many people you have converted into potential customers, you don't use your telephone number on the ads on the page, but you use a Google Voice number so that you actually know that those calls um, were routed by uh, an advertiser, an ad, basically. And um, when I think about this, I, I think always at the yellow pages. Um, like uh, maybe 15 years ago or more, Companies used to put ads on the web, on the yellow pages, and they might use a different number so that they knew that um, the calls to that number were coming from the yellow page ads. And um, that was fine because the information between the the people that called the company and the company itself was contained between these two two entities. But in this case, if you want, if you have a, um, if you're calling something that you think it's kind of personal, like um, some doctor or something related to your health or to your personal belief, that information is also shared with Google, which is a third party, or with Facebook or with someone else. Um, so yeah, that was the explanation basically, and how it works. Um, <clears throat> Um, then there is another kind of metadata, and uh, for example, I was looking at my phone uh, network logs, and uh, every um, couple of minutes there are some things that are sent to a, um, a remote server through a HTTP call, 
And these include uh, network location, for example, or a push of my contacts and so on. And um, I do not mean only the, the service that I have directly authorized, like, for example, Gmail push my contacts into my Gmail contacts. There are also um, push, uh, for example, Samsung does or other applications. And the, the thing about this then is that because this actually data goes encrypted now, you have no idea of what is actually being sent because in order to look at this data, you have to go through a very complex procedure of uh, doing some kind of many the middle attack onto the data uh, and see what your device is sending on your behalf. And then there is also like other kind of devices that send data and these are like um, um, wearable devices, uh, they track your weight, the amount of time you've been walking every day, your sleep, for example. And um, <clears throat> I, have, I have actually lo lots of friends that are technical and they like using these devices, but th they never think that there is a company that knows how many hours per day you sleep, and if you've been drinking, your sleeping partner patterns are kind of um, different or whatever. And um, there are starting, I'm, I've started to read articles about how this uh, information can be used, for example, from um, health insurance companies to say, okay, you have cancer or you have, you have had a heart attack, but we are not going to pay for your um, care because you haven't been worked enough in the last five years, things like this. And um, yeah, and then there is stuff for productivity that says that boosts productivity, and there are, they're starting to find article about it. And wait, and then there is glass, of course. And um, I mean, glass is basically a cam streaming constantly on the internet because you don't know if that is sending video or stuff. I mean, in theory, you know there is not, but how do you really know there is not? And they also have information about your blood pressure, for example, or if, you, if you're looking at a shop window or not. And they actually want to do that. They, they really want to do that. I was on a tech talk um, a while ago in Google, and they were explaining how this can be important to, to push a new kind of advertising, in which if, you, if, they, if a shop has changed their windows, you, they kind of know if people liked it, but if they stop at it and the way they reacted it by looking at the, the way they, the heart beat, basically. And I mean, I wouldn't like that. And then there are other wearables, like, <laughs> they're on the market, I mean, and it's just the beginning. And then there is website advertising again. And um, this is just um, um, a call to double click. And uh, it has embedded some keywords. Um, for example, um, if you look at it, it's like uh, neurology or psychology, anxiety. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the website because maybe I have a health condition or something or something, someone in my family or not. And this is recorded. And um, it's also recorded through the keywords that the website embeds, and that has always been this way. And so, because this happened with HTTP connection, every connection that you make, make in the browser has some selector associated with it. Um, the picture is kind of small, but basically, um, let's see if I can zoom for it. No, no more than this. Well, it's um, so it says, for example, that this connection goes from gating forum to Google Analytics, and they track a couple of things about you. So, for example, here there is the um, screen resolution, and the screen resolution, for example, used with other com combination of things, can be used to uniquely identify your browser on the internet, for example, because um, if you, if you match that with the browser plugin you're running and so on, it can be used to create a unique identifier of your browser, even if you're not logged in in any service. But we see this in a bit. 
Um, so these things of connected data and metadata takes us to something that is um, being discussed mostly in the API community, and it's about um, hyperdata and hypermedia. And um, so uh, when the web started, basically, um, it was about this concept of the hypertext, and the hypertext was linking to other hypertext. Uh, yes, exactly. And um, there was a relationship that the link kind of expressed between two pages that were connected. And this um, um, was used, for example, by search engines and so on to kind of build a model of web pages. And um, this concept is actually evolving uh, from um, the web of web pages and hypertext to the web of data and interconnected data. And this, um, this data is basically an anything and um, it can be used also for personal data. And this is what um, it happens actually in RESTful architecture. And uh, RESTful architecture, basically the archi architecture of the web. And um, it's actually a way to represent web pages um, in a way that you can abstract over them and they're not web pages anymore, but they are a resource and the URI, URI that identify that resource. And um, um, the, this representation abstracts completely on the protocols that are used or on the service that are used. So it's actually only the resource and this, this representation of the resource that can be any way to represent data and uh, the way to identify this, this resource that is the URL or URI. And uh, whatever is behind this, it's kind of connected through the server through, with a REST connector so that uh, the client doesn't know about it. And this is actually what happens when we, we interact with data, basically, on the web at this moment. Um, we have an interface that is uniform, and we request the resource through the URI, and we have the representation of the resource. It can be a page, it can be a JSON, it can be XML. And we use that, and we, we have the resources that link to other resources, and we serve through them. We are starting this with Hypermedia API and so on. And so why this matter for privacy, and why is this interesting? So because up to now, um, information about use, the users that were tracked were just a, a record in a database, for, for example. It was just a log message, okay, uh, user one has done this on this page. But now everything is started to be structured and the way the information can be mined, it's a lot more efficient. And uh, it's a lot easier basically to, to track user follow the principle in which you would uh, um, analyze web pages. That is something that, for example, search engine have been doing for the last 10 years or more, 15 years probably. So, if we look at the graph again, um, we see that um, every action has a selector. It can be a keyword, it can be the resource where the, the action has started, or it can be anything about it, really. And this, everything makes um, that action more unique because it can be searched more efficiently, it can be analyzed more efficiently. And it takes us to this idea that everything that we do is like connected in a hypergraph. And it's um, just an hypergraph, it's just a graph, and uh, where every node is connected with a set of um, edges, there are the links to other entities. And this is what happens with web pages, and this is what happens with uh, personal data at this point. So you have your identity, and uh, you have the web pages and the action that you, uh, that you visited, the action that have been um, taken on those pages. And you have uh, your post on Twitter, your post on Facebook, your friends, your connection. And it's, it, everything is connected to you, basically. And it's very easy to analyze. And this is an example of how it was analyzed, but uh, it was some document that were leaked on the Washington Post a few days ago, I think, or weeks. And they, they used the, um, the Google uh, Pref ID that is set on a cookie um, to actually identify targets um, online. And um, 
so that's that's how it is easy it is and i mean if if everyone can analyze data every time you visit a website and it's it at, at the moment it's happening only in uh, in mostly in javascript but if any of you works with web application or mobile application you might use a set of tools like third party tools like um I don't know. Um, the, there are like Google Analytics or um, uh, um, New Relic, for example, Mixpanel, and so on. They used to to track events, and this happens in the backend of an application. So in this case, you in this case you cannot you cannot know what the application is actually tracking because it happens in the backend once you're logged in. So you're not even able to look at it as you do with JavaScript or HTTP calls because it's the server that does those calls and send the data that they want to track. Yes. Um, so I was I was suggesting this um, this link because it's a study from EFF done in 2011, I think, quite a long time ago before this started to be mainstream about how you can use some statistical um, measurement of how your browser is actually unique. So, yeah, to answer that question, how unique is a footprint? Um, we can look at uh, um, a set of different things. Um, you, you can start profiling your activity and see um, what kind of um, uh, profile you're sending through um, the network, what kinds of keywords you're sending. Um, or can, or for example, you can calculate how many um, bits of information you introduce every time you add something unique to, for example, your, your browser um, profile. And, or you can start analyzing how many um, unique features you are sharing across the network. Um, there, there are studies, for example, that uh, by looking at your Twitter profile and uh, your tweet frequency, uh, across the week or across the hours, they can know if you're tweeting more at work or tweeting more at home or tweeting more in the weekend and so on. Um, application, there are like they, they know that for, that they customer are more likely to use the application in the weekends. They increase, for example, advertising during the weekends or they promote special offer. And so these are, for example, um, applications that are um, selling, I don't know, video streaming services like movies or magazines, books, and so on. They know that because you're busy, you're probably likely to do these things uh, during the night or during the weekend. So they, they kind of change their strategy um, following these patterns. Um, so, uh, when you profile over a set of categories, what you do, you, you basically count every time this, that category is expressed and you put that in a histogram. It's, it's kind, I mean, it's nothing very statistical advanced. You just count and you divide by the total and you have the histogram. And um, you can do it with like, um, I did this for myself and uh, I, uh, I was looking at stuff and you have, yeah you have the spike in computers, but somebody else can have a spike on health, for example. And that might be used for any particular reason. I don't know. Um, so this was a study that is done by DFF a while ago, and I mentioned it before. And it used um, things like the user agent in the browser, the headers that you send every time you, um, you visit a web page, the plugin, the time zone, and so on, and uh, calculate the actual, um, how unique is that feature in a set of what? I mean, the cloud is just a collection of data centers belonging to some companies. And, um, when, I mean, 15? Oh, okay. <laughs> so, when we think about this, we think, okay, um, we are giving our data to somebody else, and or that it, the data is safe, basically. And uh, but I mean, who owns the cloud? I mean, what the, even if we use different services, sometimes the infrastructure behind the cloud is by somebody else. So these are the biggest players in the cloud computing infrastructure, and it's only five. Even though, for example, there are a lot of services that use Amazon, for example, but they're still on Amazon. Um, yeah, and this is uh, like um, is basically for 
the the revenue for 2013 and still the players there are a very small number of them they actually have cloud infrastructure not that they are selling services and if we go beyond cloud providers um, this is like um, um, the cable the the website that shows cable map um, for submarine cables and all these cables they're not public they are owned by other com by companies and the way that this, the data that travels on this cable is, uh, is treated, we actually have no control about it because we don't know. Um, so I start thinking, what about mobile communication providers? Because um, um, sometimes uh, mobile infrastructure is deployed with, especially in Europe, is deployed with um, public funds. Uh, with a lot of help from, from public governments, but then they're used by the companies, that they actually can share those, um, those infrastructure. And, um, but so if, um, they, if they share their infrastructure and they actually haven't deployed it, who, who owns that infrastructure at the end or who has done it? And um, I mean, like, uh, built it. And the number of companies, again, that built um, telecommunication infrastructure on the market is not the right, high. It's actually free. And it's uh, Huawei, ZTE, and um, um, Ericsson, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so it's, again, three, three companies, mostly. So um, th there was this quote that I read a while ago about Snowden and this idea that the internet was free and then it wasn't free anymore. And th th the thing is that the infrastructure that we, we have been using in, um, has always been the same. I mean, the internet was built centralized uh, with a um, series of layers of control that are like there by design. I mean. Um, if we look at the protocols, if we look at the way there is, um, it was built, it was built with uh, the idea that was someone um, cont um, sh um, routing the information or controlling the information or uh, providing the infrastructure. It was, it was top down in a way. And that is understandable thinking about uh, um, how electronic systems were built a while ago. But um, if we want that freedom back, the, the idea was that um, I think We've been starting to research in open data, and we've been starting to, to research in open, uh, open source software, but we haven't researched in open infrastructure yet. And I think um, that's where we, we should go in order to have more, um, uh, more access and more control on the infrastructure that we use, actually. And um, another thing that uh, I think we should do this also collaborate with um, researchers outside of the telecommunication industry because uh, there are a lot of people that are, want to, to do stuff for privacy from the political point of view, from the social point of view, from the point of view of the law, and they don't know sometimes where to start or they don't have all the information. And the last thing that I suggest is to be mindful about your footprint. Um, like, if if an application wants to know your sleeping patterns, I mean, you should question that. And that's it. Cool. Thank you, Silvio. Um, I think uh, a lot of people appreciated your talk. Are there questions? We have some time for questions left. The one. Oh, well. Actually, um, two interesting points um, that you brought up that I'd like to explore a little further. Um, you mentioned, of course, people tracking fitness and sleep. Are you aware that in the US right now, there are three court cases that are using the Fitbit as part of their subpoenaed evidence? One of them is for an injury case. They want to, to demonstrate that the person was as injured as they say they are by using the fact that they can no longer exercise. Um, but the other two are divorce cases where um, someone is trying to claim that a person is not where they said they would be using the Fitbit tracker. Um, I, I actually read something about it. I, um, I, I read that it was used in court cases. I didn't know the actual um, no. cases. And the, the thing that I read mostly was about um, health insurance companies. And yeah. yes. Um, 
The second thing re was regarding um, the mobile phone. Um, it was in recently revealed that both Verizon and AT&T in the US were adding an additional tracking um, signature to everyone who used the browser on their mobile phones so that they could then get a complete record of every site that you've gone to once you leave their connection. And um, AT&T has, has claimed that they are no longer going to use it, but, but Verizon has made no claim at all. They, they're going to continue to collect that information. But the, the thing is that it's, I mean, it's very easy to add a parameter to a URL. Yeah. You, you, I it's, mean, once the, the call goes through their service, they can do whatever they want with it. And, and they, they nothing, have the information anyhow. Yeah, and it's very so, difficult for us to find out that they're actually doing it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. The work you're doing is great, thank you. So, here's another question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, my question is, what we could do to reduce our uh, web footprint now? I mean, we should use all the time uh, the Tor Browser bundle with, uh, I mean, in a virtual ma machine? Um, the, the question is um, what we can do with, about the, the footprint, yeah. and if we can use, we can mitigate that with Tor. In yeah, I mean, Tor Browser bundle is uh, like uh, unrecognizable, I mean. I, I actually run the Panoptic click yeah. uh, with Tor, and um, uh, okay, so with my usual setup, the, the bit of information were about 22 hmm. that I was sending. And with Tor, it was getting down to 12 using uh, the Tor bundle. Still, if you, if you keep browsing with the same bundle, mm -hmm. um, although your location might change and so on, the, the, there are information that you, that you send, for example, about uh, um, the cookies that you store or you decide not to store if you need to and um, the, um, your profile, basically, the things yeah. that you've been surfing. I mean, after a while, your profile becomes a Huge. part of your footprint, so that's, that's the thing. Thanks. Thank you. So, now, your question, please. Okay, so, um, sometimes it's not practical to use a Tor Browser bundle because it's just not fast enough with the rerouting. Um, do you have any other recommendations? one could use to stay a bit, you know, like low profile? Um, the, the thing is that once you log in or you accept cookies, um, there isn't much you can do. I mean, you, you, can, you, you can stop any um, JavaScript calls, for example, to third party, and you can do that with a number of um, browser extension, <coughs> but if, if this is something that is being doing, uh, it's, it happens in the back end of an application, you have no way to know what information have, have been collected. And with mobile fo phones, it's even worse because even if you don't use the browser and you use applications, um, they, you, the, if, even when you do not log in into anything, into an account, they use the, the device ID or they generate an ID for that device in order to use it to track you. So. Maybe, maybe a follow up on that one. Like, um, how. Would a, like a web browser, how would it have to be designed to um, actually, you know, prevent these kind of things happening? Um, or is it, or maybe is it possible to design a web browser in a way that so it's much harder to track you? Um, the, 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 um, so the question is, if it's possible to design a browser that is harder to track, um, um, there are um, privacy extension that can help to to block calls and can help you say, okay, every time I visit, for example, the New York Times, I make uh, these calls to these servers, and these servers are located in this location and are sending this data, and I can say block this, and you're probably blocking some ads and so on. Um, but um, again, it's, it's not like everything needs to happen in the, in the client. As a as client, you, when you use a client, you can protect yourself. But as soon as that goes into the server, and um, unless you always uh, kind of send forged information, like uh, you always change the location through a proxy, and you always uh, send like um, bogus keywords to say that uh, if I'm searching for something, for example, basketball, I'm, I'm sending like a set of keywords through other websites, like, um, um, I don't know, business, economics, and uh, religion, whatever. Um, unless you do this all the time, 
that there is always a way that they can track you because the the way the infrastructure the the infrastructure is designed is to collect data, and the the, the development of big data is about data points that use, users have generated, and they can help them analyze stuff. I don't know from uh, from um, if the application is used more um, from London or New York, or from if uh, I don't know one magazine is read more than another one, or ma one article in the New York Times is more interesting than another one. Um, you name it, you can do it, basically. Thank Thanks. you. Okay, then there's one question from the internet and another in the room. So first the one from the internet. Okay, would it be any help to randomize all possible tracking variables, maybe um, by an HTTP proxy that modifies the relevant content? Um, so the question is if you can use um, tracking barriers and HTTP proxy to, um, to avoid this. Um, you, you can certainly use it, but um, you are also aware that um, your online experience changes. And um, um, again, you cannot, you, some, you cannot use that all the time when you use, for example, um, your mobile or um, things like that. So tracking, um, anti-tracking technology exists and they're starting to be developed, but in my opinion, they're only in the client. And um, they, they also need to be, uh, we also need an effort for the, um, from the social point of view, from the political point of view to, to say there is so much you can do with personal data. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, then at the moment the last question there. Hey, thank you. Um, I have a question concerning the identity hypergraph and um, if you have any information, if there's any debate on the strategic value of that. Uh, since there's, um, in the US at least, there is a process called the National Strategy for Secure Transactions on, in Cyberspace where they basically want to create a marketplace for identity services. And I wonder um, if the vendors that you have knowledge about um, participate in that discussion and what role the hypergraph plays in that? Um, so um, the question is about the hypergraph and um, security services. Or the political value or the strategic value of that, if you're aware of any discussions or if you have seen anything that points to... Okay, um, and thanks. So the, the idea about the, the hypergraph that is part of my PhD um, research and thesis, and I use it to analyze data and to not to have just to query a database, but to be able to say, okay, um, if this person was interested in psychology, maybe they're also interested in anxiety or they also did something with that. And um, the, the political idea behind this is that if you know what you have been tracked for, or if you know what information you're sending um, on the internet, you'll be able to say, okay, I want to do something about this. So the idea is that if you posted, for example, um, something on Twitter, Facebook, or whatever, that says something that you don't want about you, like you, whatever, you, you accidentally post something on a, a, like Xanax or something like this, you are able to remove it and to know that you actually did it. And um, or for example, if you know that um, because of a number of connections that you have on, uh, um, on Facebook or on Twitter, you're actually more likely to appear um, of one the religion as opposed to another, or you put, you're, you're more likely to appear gay or straight or whatever, you, you might not want that to be shown, and you might want you might want to recognize what is actually being revealed about you by your activity. So the idea of the epigraph that I had was that that I I, I might I by analyzing the information that I share, I'm able to know okay I need to delete this, and if I delete this node, I also delete all this information about me. Um, politically, I I don't know if this a discussion is happening. I know that, I mean, the thing is that it's the way the, um, the NSA and the, the, um, uh, the, 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 the leaked documents talked about metadata. There was a, something about a node and selectors. And this, that reminded me of a graph structure and a link, actually. When they say selector, I thought of a link and that was it. I don't know if I answered the question. Thanks. Okay, I don't see any more questions at the moment. If 
anybody has another question, you can just shout now or wave. Doesn't seem to be the case. So thank you again for this talk. Um.